Hello and welcome to this show. Today I have with me the wonderful human being and a best sales coach trainer who can help you out what exactly you need to understand with respect to the science of sales process. So I welcome Moed Amin. So he is a founder, director, and he, is a, uh, he has been with the sales industry for the more than two decades. He actually brought more than 200 million euros into the client's bank accounts. So it's not an easy job. He interviewed more than 428 B2B business buyers irrespective of the levels from the 10 different sectors and found the, the real secret, the real element that is required to drive the decision-making process of B2B sales. He nailed down it and through the proverbial door, the company that he runs, he is actually helping many companies in different verticals build their sales process based on the science and the sales conversational communication and approach based on the neuroscience. That's the power of what Moeda Amin can bring on the table. And you cannot miss this episode. You cannot miss this video. If you are really particular about building a solid sales process based on the science, and approach based on the neuroscience. I welcome Moed. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chandra. It's a great, uh, thank you for that great introduction. And uh, it, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be here and, you know, share some really valuable insights and, and approaches with uh, your community that you've built. Thank you very much, Moed, for giving us time. And I'm really happy to have you today in the show. Uh, right now, I just wanted to know how exactly you started as a career in the sales and where did you start your childhood and then in a brief shot so that people can understand how you started your career, your education, and then how you started into the sales, what motivated you to get into the sales? Yeah. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I think like most people, um, it was never by design. Um, okay. sales was, it was never a profession that I, um, planned to be in. Okay. Um, I, I come from a neuroscience or science background. Um, oh. and, uh, you know, I wasn't really sure where, where I wanted to go next. Uh, you know, neuroscience is not my only degree. I have others. And I guess that was because I wasn't sure what to do. And, um, while I was trying to figure out what to do, um, I kept seeing, uh, you know, sales related jobs, uh -huh. um, in all the different forums and, and I saw how much it was potentially paying. Okay. And the idea was, um, you know, I will do sales for two or three years while I figure out what I wanted, okay. um, you know, earn some good money and then, you know, hopefully find a, a professional career that, 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 uh, you know, appeal to me. Um, <clears throat> And so it turns out that sales was the profession that did appeal to me. And so 20 years, over 20 years later, here, here I am. Oh, great, great, great. So what exactly is the triggering point? You felt like, yeah, yeah, this is mine kind of stuff when you were just started exploring in the sales. What you felt, there is a connection. There is something that you feel like, yes, this is mine. And I'm going to spend my lifetime, something like that. Is there any particular event or anything that episode that you remember uh, you know that's a really good question um <clears throat> i guess the the moment came when i realized the connection that sales had to to two main things two or three main things actually that uh really appealed to me um number one and the first well the first and big one was the moment i realized that actually my uh, my neuroscience and the behavioral psychology that I'd studied um, okay. had a deep connection to sales that wasn't being applied at that time, actually. Okay. Um, and this was back in 2006, mm. uh, 2006 to 2008. Um, 
And then the second thing that I realized was, um, you know, I'd always wanted to learn about business um, and I'd always wanted to go into the business world, actually. Um, and I realized how powerful sales was in understanding business because, um, you know, you can have the best products, uh, you know, you can yeah. have um, the best solutions, but um, they really meant nothing without a strong sales and marketing approach. Um, because it's such a highly competitive world. Um, and then I, I think the third thing was the the fact that it was a meritocra meritocracy, mm. which meant that, you know, one of my other degrees was law. And in the UK, which is uh, slightly different to places like America, I don't know how it is in India, but in the UK, when it comes to the legal profession, um, back then... Um, mm you couldn't progress in your career what well, your your career progression was based upon your tenure hmm. which meant that no matter how good you were you know you had to be in the role for 10 or 15 years before you started to progress to partner level for example yeah um, the and, like that yeah and and it wasn't it was all about tenure and and how long you've been in it and and i really didn't like that sales hmm. i saw was a profession where it was really meritocracy you know, what you put in, uh, you got out. And if you were intelligent enough, if you were driven enough, and if you got the results, hmm. um, you know, the sky was really the limit. And so I I was really attracted to those three things. So it was the connection between sales and, and the science. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I really saw the connection between what I'd learned in neuroscience to sales. Um, the fact that sales was an integral part to understanding business, um, and also the final part, which is the meritocracy. You know, what I put in, I, I got out. And I suppose it was it was when I realized those three things, that's when I saw sales and business as a whole as, as really the career that I've been looking for. Exactly. So I really appreciate this journey and you are able to get into the neuroscience and immediately pick up the, the elements of neuroscience can be immediately applicable to the sales, more relevant. That also linked to your own passion of becoming a better uh, at business, but still it has to start with the sales. That link is really great. So uh, how do you think the understanding of the neuroscience and its relevance on sales actually changes the way that we look at the sales? Is there any kind of uh, one or two things that you can share or one point with respect to that? So if we don't have the understanding of neuroscience, we will tend to get into this trap or we may develop the misconception. We may miss the opportunity like this, something like that. Is there anything like that? Yeah, so let's start with, it's a good question. Let's start with the first thing. Um, at the end of the day, um, it is the buyers that hold your money. Hmm. Um, and it's the buyers that will make you successful because okay. it, it's it's them who will pay you and mm. see your business grow. And, and you can call the buyers the market as well as a whole. It just depends how big you want to think about it. And so if we don't understand the perspective of the buyer, mm. um, then very simply, you're going to miss out opportunities. There's a big hole in your approach. Okay. Um, as a business, we get, it. you know, let's let's make it as simple as possible. It, it's a question of whose story you are constantly thinking about. If you're thinking about your own story, mm. your own products, um, your own passion about um, your business and your product and why it's great, um, then you're really limiting your potential because you're limiting your perspective. Right. And But if you're thinking about the story of the buyer and the market as a whole, all of a sudden, not only is your perspective widened, but your your what I call your sphere of consequence widens as well. Your understanding of um, the context for how the value you bring applies to the world of your buyers and their community. And so um, why is this about neuroscience? It's because, quite frankly, you're not selling to a company. You're mm -hmm. not selling to even an individual you're selling to the brain within that individual. And mm. we are we are having, you know, we're not alive, we're having a biochemical experience. Mm. 
And so understanding the biochemical experience, the fundamentals there, that helps you understand the how and why of how people make decisions. Mm -hmm. And if you understand that, um, then you can, the door completely opens to you being able to reverse engineer that understanding into a sales process that will make it incredibly hard for your competitors to beat you because you are, mm -hmm. you are, you are taking it from the source mm -hmm. um, as opposed to your story, which is, um, you know, I want to make my millions and become wealthy um, mm. or, um, you know, I want to satisfy an ego or mm. I want to, you know, I'm I'm in love with my product. You know, you shouldn't be in love with your product. You should be in love with your customers um, because by doing that, your product will always be the best fit for them compared mm. to anyone else. Yeah. Uh, you will always be in line with the trends because it's your buyers that are dictating the trends at the end of the day exactly. yes there are, yes technology technology and things like that will is a factor in trends but it's only a factor when it actually a, a, a improves the life of the buyers okay. and so it still comes back to that so i guess that's why neuroscience is so important and and what i tell my clients is you don't have to become a neuroscience expert you don't have to become that knowledgeable okay that's what i'm there for um of course that's where they have to trust me and that's why i have to build my trust so that's where the perspective of the buyer comes in but um as long as you understand the fundamentals for how people think and why they think in a certain way huh. then you have the the most powerful ingredient to help you in your commercial approach. Correct. Wonderful, wonderful. So they don't have to become an expert in neuroscience, but the fundamentals of behaviors or the decisions, if they can understand how those actually influencing the uh, sales process, if they can understand, then that will be really helpful in accelerating their sales process. Yes. And, 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 and the thing to add to that, Chandra, is um, just there's a very simple approach, right? It's it's sorry, it's straightforward, maybe not simple. Mm. And that is just spend time with your customers. Spend time in their life and seeing what their life is about, because you don't want to just see their life in relation to how they use your product. You want to see the whole life because yeah, yeah. and this is what i mean by sphere of consequence Without labeling them as a customer exactly so it's not just looking correct hello your voice is breaking your next voice... the process of yeah yeah got it yeah sure sure um you want to look at the whole thing because how when you improve one area that ultimately has an impact in other areas in their lives. Correct. And when you understand that other areas, well, all of a sudden your value is a lot bigger. Mm. And also you're seeing trends outside that can impact the core area that you're involved with as well. So you're going to be able to do something else, which is incredibly powerful, which is see around corners. And that is really valuable to your marketing, your sales, but also to your product development and innovation as well. Um, exactly. And so, you, you know, you don't have to be a neuroscience expert. You just got to be very, you just got to be in love with your customers. You've got to want to spend time with them. You're going to want to observe, want to ask the right questions, questions that are not layered with your bias, but questions that are helping you to understand more deeply the perspective of the buyer and, you know, why and how that's important to them and what impact it has with them. So that's why I say to people, you don't have to be a neuroscience expert. You just got to spend time with your customers and just ask the right questions that are not layered with your bias. That's very practical advice. They can understand the depth of what exactly they can do within the time they get with the customer and why they should spend more time. That's wonderful. So understanding that because they need to spend time, hmm. they cannot spend time just like that. There should be a process around these sales. So what should be the signs of building a successful sales process in the B2B irrespective of the uh, industry? What do you think should be the uh, elements or steps? Uh, how to look at the creating this uh, sales process so that it can be more effective from the buyer's perspective? 
Yeah. Can you share light on that? Very good question. Um, the first thing is something that we have heard a lot about, but very, very, very few people do this. And so the first thing is, if you're going to understand your customers, you need to know um, your ICP, your ideal customer profile. Right. Um, and that's related to your product, your value, your culture, et cetera, and things like that. Um, but you've got to understand who your ideal customer profile is. And that is not a, an exercise that you complete. That is an ongoing exercise that will always be for the life journey of your business. Right. And so it starts with understanding who your ideal customers are and what makes them an ideal customer for you versus any of your competitors. Mm. Once you understand what that is, um, the next thing you should understand is your buyer's journey. Again, this is a concept that we we hear a lot, but mm -hmm. again, very, very few people and companies have done this very well. Those mm -hmm. two things, if I talk, if you do those two things really well, that will give you an edge over 90% of the market out there. Mm -hmm. um, and when we talk about the buyer's journey, um, the buyer's journey is not when your sales process starts. The buyer's journey is much, has much, is much broader and much deeper than you realize. Mm. Um, so let's start with broader. Mm. A buyer's journey doesn't start with their interaction with you. Um, the buyer's journey starts much, much earlier on where there is some form of trigger um, mm. that is just related to your industry or sphere. So if you're going to a restaurant, for example, and you're a restaurant owner, um, mm. you said B2B. So let's take B2B. Let's say you're a SaaS provider. Okay. And you're a SaaS provider um, that provides, uh, let's use the example of Miro, right? So Miro is a, is a, um, uh, brain, um, what's it called? A mind map software, right? It's a mind okay. map and almost project management software. Hmm. Um, the buyer's journey doesn't start when they're trying to take notes. Hmm. The buyer's journey starts even earlier, which is, um, a frustration or a problem with um, helping people collaborate, helping people put their information down that they're acquiring into a format that allows them to, or, to retrieve the information, make sense of the information and say, share the information. Hmm. There are minute trigger points um, in a buyer's world and their life journey that will start the process. So it doesn't start with the sales approach. Okay. It doesn't start even just before that on marketing and awareness. It starts much earlier in the in the buyer's journey. And that's usually an internal thing that's going on. Mm. And, and so it starts from there. And it doesn't end when someone becomes a client. It doesn't even end when someone is a client and there's an account management process. Okay. It ends a lot further, um, which is the ultimate job to be done, the ultimate outcome. And, and it goes beyond that to the point of, you know, will the client refer you? And, and what is that referral mechanism like, uh, like right? What mm. is that process like? H how will they recommend you to others? Mm. Where, in what forum, in what channels, in what networks are they doing that? And where is your... In exactly. So think of the buyer's journey as far, far wider, right? So that's mm. the first thing. The next thing I said is that it's a lot deeper. And what I mean by that is mm. most people look at buyer's journey and look at that and say, okay, what is the, what is the thing that they're trying to do or what is happening in that step in each stage of the buyer's journey? Um, but what people miss out on are the emotional elements, right? Mm. Two things, the emotional elements and the job to be done. Um, in the emotional elements, there are questions like, what are the frustrations that people are experiencing at that stage? Um, what are the desires that they're trying to experience in each of those stages, right? Um, what are the things that annoy them? What are the things that anger them? What are the things that make things difficult? What are the things that make them excited? So exactly. most people forget about the emotions, right? And the emotions drive action. Emotion is the currency by which we value life. Mm. We can go into that later on if you want. Um, you. So they look at emotions, but the, the next thing that people forget is what is the job to be done at each stage? Mm. So let me give you an example. Um, I worked with a company that provides um, revenue management software and services to the uh, consumer goods industries. So they work with very large consumer goods companies. Um, 
one of the things that we looked at was the, there's two there, there's particular stages in the buyer's journey. One stage in the buyer's journey was um, I've decided um, that we need to have revenue management and I'm now considering the vendors that I can possibly work with. Well, the job to be done, there, there are some frustrations and emotions there. We'll put that to one side. The job to be done is how do I assess each of those vendors so that I can make a good decision that makes me look good? That's the okay. job to be done. Okay. But, and this, and most, most salespeople think that's where the buyer is. But there's a stage sometimes before that, actually, which is um, we haven't decided if revenue management is the thing we want yet. Or actually, no, the, the stage before that is someone might have thought, you know what, I've looked at all the options. And I think, you know, we can't build this ourselves. We can't continue doing Excel using Excel. We actually need to buy a revenue management software and platform because that's going to help us actually price our promotions and planning and all those things better. The problem is I believe in revenue management software, but my stakeholders in my company do not. They need mm -hmm. to be convinced. And so the job to be done there is completely different to the job to be done of selecting vendors. Yeah. The job to be done there now is I need to help convince my stakeholders that we must explore revenue management software. We cannot continue using Excel. It's just too complicated, too time consuming. The requirement and has so, to be established, aligned with the current uh, team. Exactly. They need to convince all the stakeholders that we need to go down this road. And so a salesperson that recognizes that the job to be done there is to help that champion mm. convince everyone, the stakeholders of the benefits of revenue management software versus the existing approach, which is using Excel. That's the job to be done. Yeah. And if you can't convince them, and if you're just trying to sell, 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 you're mm. not helping them do the job that they're trying to do at that stage in their buying journey. But if you help for that person internally, there may be pressure, stress on him if more push is done. <laughs> if the salesperson tries to push, sell, 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 that may build more pressure to that person. Well, it's not just build more pressure. That 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 buying that buyer is going to push themselves away from you. Yeah. Because they're right. not there yet. That's not where they are. Okay. They are trying to convince their internal stakeholders internal that we need to. Be. Yeah, we need to invest 250,000, 300,000, sometimes half a million in a solution like this. Mm. But if you help them make that job done easily, guess what happens? All of a sudden, their trust with you will increase very high. Exactly. Um, when they decide that a vendor, we have to go to a vendor now, we have to go down revenue management, guess who's going to be more favorable? Is it the salesperson that pushed, 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 pushed when they were not ready? Or is the salesperson that served them, that helped them along the journey? So understanding the job to be done and the emotions that they're going through at each stage of that buying journey is also incredibly valuable. So the two things is um, and identify what makes an ideal customer an ideal customer for you. Be very, very clear about what that is because be sales so. is a very expensive and tough game if done yeah. wrong. If you are looking at building your business in a profitable way, you've got to look at the market and focus on the market that's right for you. Yeah. Um, and then the second thing is understand the buyer's journey in terms of breadth as well as depth, right? So those are the first two things. Um, once you understand what those two things are, you're in a much better pro uh, place to work backwards now to do a few things. Number one is hire the right people. Um, a lot of the times we hire the wrong people. That's a mm. very expensive mistake to have. If you understand the nature of your customers and what's going on there and how they make decisions about your particular product or solution, then you'll be far more informed about the characteristics and the skills and the temperament of the salespeople that you need. Yeah. Um, you Can will I also understand... Decode the competencies expected for that. Absolutely. Role. Abs because if you have the wrong competencies and characteristics, mm. then you're not going to have people that gel and engage very well with your buyers, okay. right? At the at the different stages of the journey, 
Um, the other thing it will help you with is it will help you understand what incentive structures to create. Because the incentive structures will um, elicit specific behaviors. And if they are the wrong behaviors, you're going to damage your reputation with your buyers. If they're the right behaviors, you're going to enhance those reputations. And so you need to understand what the incentive structure will be. And that, that comes from understanding the ideal customer profile and the buying journey and how long they take to make a decision, all those things. Um, it helps you understand if you need to take a direct sales route or a partnership sales route, or maybe a mixture of both. Hmm. Again, if you understand who your ideal customers are, um, then you will understand which companies out there have great relationships with those buyers and yeah. you might want to build an alliance with them. Exactly. Right? Um, you also will understand the right types of sales leader to hire. Most people make a very, very expensive mistake, which is they hire a sales leader first as they're expanding and then build a team around them. That may not be the right approach for you, depending mm. on the stage of your business. And then the final thing is... Um, you will be able to train and guide your salespeople on how they have specific conversations. You will be able to equip them with the right message and information about value and approaches and understanding of the competitors. You'll be able to equip them with the right information around what is the, what is going on in that buyer's world and how to, how to research and ask questions that will help you identify where they are on that buying journey and therefore what you need to do to help them. So, it, it, what you asked was a quite a complicated question and I've tried to distill it down into Perfect. kind of simple, straightforward areas. But th those are yeah. the things that I would look so at. So I understand uh, based on your detailed briefing, whatever you encapsulated, try to encapsulate into uh, to build a sales process based on this science. So one must first understand what exactly is the target market or what exactly is the IPC ideal customer profile. And then uh, they should be able to navigate, uh, to connect those IPC and serve those IPC rather than pushing the sales, serving them as the uh, opening the door and exactly what is the job to be done, something mm. that I really liked the way that you put forward. What is the What are the emotions involved in? Uh, what is the uh, struggles, uh, psychological uh, uh, struggles or fears of, uh, whatever around that particular person in that particular stage of buying. So first uh, come up with the stages of this particular buyer's journey and then each mm. stage, what is the emotion job to be done is something very uh, insightful and uh, very helpful, especially for the B2B, uh, just uh, having a meeting and then follow-up meeting, follow-up meeting, follow-up meeting, everything, they come up with a different reason to connect and then try to do, which may or may not make sense. Most of the times they end up updating something, new product has come, sir. So... Uh, that has that, that is completely uh, not an educated way of or informed way of dealing with the prospects of today's scenario. So yeah, as you said, uh, coming up with stages and then uh, understanding the emotions, understanding the job to be done really makes uh, more uh, effective in the process. Uh, that I really appreciate that. Thank you for that. So uh, to go deeper into this uh, aspect of it uh, i just wanted to understand what is the b2b sales cycle uh, in the each in the b2b sales cycle if you come up with a two or three steps typical steps irrespective of the industry what steps under each step what should be the thought process of the business owner or the founder what should be the thought process or approach of the sales people under that step is there any, anything that you can share from your uh, overall understanding of it? So uh, just to make sure I understand, Chandra, is your question asking um, what are the steps in the process from the sales perspective and what they need to what they need to understand in each process and what they need to know to yeah, do it well? From the business owners and the founders perspective, uh, sales persons perspective, what they should be aware of in that steps, each step. Right, okay. So the first answer is probably not the answer you're going to expect, but it's 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 an answer that has to be given, Chandra, which is um, although the steps seem linear from a sales side, um, it actually is far more complicated because of the buyer steps. Yeah, so you can um, uh, share a buyer's perspective only. That will be 
Well, what I would recommend is anyone that's listening or watching to this, um, if you type in uh, Gartner B2B buying journey, um, you will see a diagram that's very messy, very complicated. And that's because the buying process is very complicated. And the salesperson has to navigate all of that. And so sometimes what we have is we have, uh, you know, first call or first meeting in a sales journey, second meeting, demo, negotiation, sale agreement, and then closing a contract. But it's not that straightforward. It's not <laughs> that linear because you will go forward, then come back, then go, and then you have to speak to this person, then that person, then this person, and then that person has to, it's very messy, okay. right? Okay. Um, but what I will do is simplify certain things. Wonderful. The first thing is um, there is a first interaction. Now that first interaction is not the first sales meeting. Mm. Um, it is not, it, it, it's the outbound process. Mm. Um, and so the outbound process can be a cold email. It can be a cold call. It can be a, um, a webinar. You know, it, it's the outreach, right? Um, now, what are the things you have to do very well there? Number one, stop thinking about yourself. That is the first biggest advice I give you. Um, <laughs> I conducted a study where I looked at thousands and thousands of outbound emails and uh, cold calls, listen to cold calls, and I mean thousands. Um, in the first few lines of an email, the average time the salesperson used the word I was mm. nine times. Oh. The average time the, in the first 30 seconds of the call, the average time a salesperson says I was tw 12 or 13 times. I need to check the number again, but it's mm. 12 or 13. And so what happens when someone, when your bias hears the word I from the seller all the time? Um, immediately they think, well, it's all about you. It's not about me. Mm. and so the first thing you need to do is um stop thinking about yourself everything that you think and the language used has to be from the perspective of the buyer and so if you're going to do that very well what are the things you have to do right um the first there are four things you need to do research on because yeah. you have to know the customer as deeply as you possibly can based upon the situation right um I get a lot of requests from people that says, how can we do personalization at scales at scale? Sorry. Uh, and so mm. the first thing, the first thing I'm going to tell, I, and I understand the desire for business owners and salespeople to reach as many people as possible in as little time as possible and most efficient, et cetera. Um, but don't be surprised when your, when your conversion rates are very poor. Don't be surprised when your conversion rates are one or 2% maximum. And that's because buyers are very aware, very knowledgeable about this templated approach. Um, mm -hmm. you cannot do personalization at scale. Take it from a neuroscientist, someone who studied neuroscience, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there is no such thing as personalization at scale. The very definition of personalization is it's personal to you and to that. These one are person. two contradictory things. Totally two contradictory. Yes. What, but what you can do is relevancy at scale. Mm, mm, mm. and here's how you can do relevancy at scale here's one of the most powerful ways to do relevancy at scale the first level of research you must do is not the company it's not the individual it is the industry of the buyer um in my research with those you mentioned the 428 b2b buyers um when we ask those buyers um rate the confidence confidence level you have in the salesperson who has Co deep company and deep knowledge about your company rate your confidence level around their skills and their ability to care about you okay they on a scale of one to five they rate they rated the score of two mm. when we ask them what's your confidence level of a salesperson that has deep knowledge about your company and a deep knowledge about your industry and demonstrates those knowledge mm. the, the confidence level shoots up from two to four out of five Okay. there are several research from things like demand base and others that show the importance of industry knowledge for the buyer when a buyer sees that a salesperson has deep industry knowledge about the buyer's industry mm -hmm. um, they really really value that 
Um, and if you know the if you know the industry information, you all of a sudden know the context in which that buyer is making decisions within the dynamics of that industry. Right. And so if you want to have relevance, you understand scale, the bigger perspective so that you will be able to understand the inside dynamics. Yes, because if you understand the dynamics of the competitors, the supplier strength, the buyer strength, the um, the um, influencing uh, factors and all influencing yeah. factors, um, growth rates, right? So if a company is growing at 2%, but their industry is growing at 1%, they're outperforming the industry. The mm -hmm, decisions are mm -hmm. specific to that context. But mm -hmm. if a company is growing at 2%, but the industry is performing at 10%, very different perspective, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you understand the industry, um, you can actually, you, you have a chance to actually uh, scale your, out, your outreach with messages that are relevant, right? So your salespeople and your marketing people have to understand the industry of their buyers. That's the first thing you need to know. The next thing you need to know is the um, information about the company. Um, this is where your business acumen and specifically your financial acumen is very important. Sales is a function of business. It is at the sharpest end of where your business meets the market. If you cannot speak the language of business, which is finance, then you have no place in business. So you've got to understand, um, especially if you're working with a publicly traded company where the information is available, you must understand what their financial statements are telling you. It's telling you a story. It is giving, it is helping you understand the character of the people that are making those decisions. Mm. Um, you know, why are they making this decision around this? And you think, ah, it's because their gross margins are very high or sorry, very low, or their net margins are very low, but their gross margins are very high. So something's happening in the SGNA that's make you understand the, 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 the dynamics of the decisions. That you get are a lot of so clues from that you will get a huge amount of clues from that. Mm. And even if you're selling to a company that's not public, um, have a look at their competitors' public statements. Um, figure out what's going there. And by proxy, you will probably understand something about what's happening in a business. And even if you don't get an aspect of that information, um, if you build enough trust with the buyer, you can ask questions that won't make them feel uncomfortable. So you don't ask them questions, which is tell me about your gross margins or because it's confidential information they might not tell you, but you will get some clues as to what's going on. So industry, company, um, understand the role of the buyer, the job to be done of that buyer's role. Mm -hmm. um, I have asked hundreds upon hundreds of salespeople this one question. Give me the top three, to, give me the three or five MBOs, so management by objectives of your buyer. Describe them to me. Out of the hundreds, guess how many were able to give me that answer clearly and confidently? Mm. Um, only five. Only five people were able to tell me confidently and clearly the job to be done for their buyers. So if you're selling to a CTO or a CMO or a CEO or a or a head of HR, these MBOs are the very things that will uh, that are they are being measured on for whether they have done a good job mm -hmm. and whether they will be promoted, whether they will get a bonus, all those things. This is the thing that they are measured on by their managers to say, are you of value to us in this company? Okay. If you don't know what those things are, then how can you possibly understand mm -hmm. the value that you bring to them? Correct. Right? Yeah. And so you've got to know the job to be done of the role that you're speaking with. Now, there are some tips here to help you. Very easy to find mm. this out. Number one, look at job sites, LinkedIn, Glassdoor, whatever it is. Mm. The job sites will tell you a VP of sales or a VP of marketing or a head of HR, what is it that we want this person to be able to achieve and do for us? Mm. Um, you can go to the person's LinkedIn profile. It will tell you a lot of the times they describe what it is that they're there to do. Right? Right. Um, you, there is, you can look at glass doors. Well. There are so many areas where you can look at. Here's another trick. If you sell to a CTO, if you have a CTO in your company, go and speak to your CTO and ask them, what is your job to be done? Hmm. Simple the amount of time, it. very simple, but so powerful, Chandra. The amount of times yeah. I have not seen people ask their own buyers in their own company 
people mm -hmm. they have more open access to than anyone else. Um, you know, it's such a simple thing, but yet they so don't powerful. look it uh, from that angle that I can understand that particular person's job to be done from my own organization. They don't see it as an opportunity. But Absolutely. Uh, uh, here, uh, if I can add, mm. how I learned sales, I always look at as a buyer's perspective. I always uh, look at uh, somebody, even a family member, uh, I accompany them when they are purchasing something. I see them from buyer and the seller perspective. That real right. life conversation from there, I learn a lot. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so in terms of outbound, so just to answer your original question, which is all the steps in the sales process in the outbound, um, you've got to learn what you need to learn in the space and time that you have. I understand you can't do a three hour research, but that's where AI and chat GPT is incredibly powerful. It's a tool that I use all the time, every day now. Okay. Um, but anyway, putting that aside, you've got to know enough about your out, your buyer to be able to tailor an outbound that's that's specific to their perspective. Not about you, not about your product, not about we are doing this and this and that. It's all about... I've industry, company, person. Person and then... The, uh, the, uh, sorry, industry, company, role, role and role. then person, right? Okay. Um, now, you don't have to do all of that in a deep level for the outbound process. The outbound process is just to get them interested enough and curious enough to want to have the first meeting with you, right? Mm -hmm. But you've got to be able to know enough to have something that is very, um, very much about them, okay. right? Um, curious, we're seeing that uh, your peers or your challenges we're seeing for you are X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. We've seen other we've seen other CTOs make the mistake of trying to solve it this way, but those that did it this other way mm -hmm. um, saw a completely different performance level would you would you be interested in hearing more about this right it's all about them not about you so that's the yeah. first thing the outbound mm -hmm. when you have the meeting um the mistake that people make in the meeting is firstly they don't do any research you mm -hmm. need to spend a minimum of 30 minutes i would say an hour if you can at least doing research about the person that those things industry company role and then individual the human being um, and you can understand the human being very simply by just understanding their disk profile. This is where companies like crystalnose.com or humanticai.com, uh, is it .com or humanticai, um, you can use those tools. They have a plugin into LinkedIn that scrapes the information from their LinkedIn profile and it gives you a disk profile, right? Okay. Are they an analytical? Are they, a, um, you know, whatever the, whatever the disk profile is. So, and that gives you a a bit more information as to how they think of their psychological handy to information to go through. Very handy. It doesn't mean it's accurate. You don't judge, but it, at least it helps you a bit more. Right? Correct. Um, so, and the other thing that you, you should do is don't go in asking open questions. You know, tell me about your challenges. Tell me about your problems. Buyers want you to go in with an idea. Now, mm. it doesn't mean that the idea mm. has to be accurate um i call it a hypothesis right the challenger approach calls it an insights led approach right whatever it is you've got to come in with an idea and an, an idea that is um i use the framework cures so a great idea cures apathy so okay. it has to be it has to arouse curiosity it has to be unique in either information or perspective it has to be relevant it has to be emotional or create an emotional response, and it's got to be surprising. Yet you should have two or three of those at least, right? Mm. Um, and so go in with a hypothesis, go in with an idea as to how you're going to help improve their job and job to be done, right? How you're going to elevate their career, whatever it might be. Um, okay. And from that, then you can start to ask smart questions. Buyers really dislike it when you ask them questions that are, you know, think things that you could have researched that information yourself because they think that's just very lazy. They don't have the time mm. and they would rather speak to someone that's done their homework. And so that's the important thing. And then as you go through the sales steps, there is an expectation of what's to be done during each of those sales steps. Um, and when you go through the hypothesis stage and, and stage and you have that first call, your job is to earn the right to the next stage in the process for the buyer. And that next stage might be, 
um, helping them have that discussion internally. It could be, you know, a product demo. It could be gathering stakeholders and convincing stakeholders. Mm. You should ask them what that next stage looks like for them. So Mm -hmm. Chandra, I think we've had a great conversation today. We've managed to talk about A, B, and C, and I've shown you how we can help you address those areas. It sounds like we've had a pretty good conversation. Would you agree so far, right? And Mm -hmm. hopefully you will say yes. Yeah. And then you'll say, typically, when we speak to CTOs like you, the next stages tend to look like this. Mm. Is that the same for you? Is there something that's different in relation to your business? Mm. Invite them to tell you what those next stages are and why Mm. they're important. And then you ask them, okay, for us to take this to the next stage for you, what does that next stage look like? Because you're describing it's A, B, and C. Um, Tell me about what that next stage is. Where is the, where are the things that are going to be difficult for you in that stage? Is it time? Is it the fact that you have to deal with these other people? What does that next stage look like? Mm. And schedule the time there on the call. Don't say, okay, let's email afterwards and talk about the next date or et cetera. Schedule that time with them. Say, look, let's pencil in some time. Mm. Even if it changes, it changes, but let's have something that we're working towards okay. and you're free to cancel or, or, or postpone it or reschedule it as you see fit. That way, you're going to minimize any what they call ghosting. You're going to minimize any time where they're just not responding to you. And because you've asked them what that next stage looks like for them, you're now in a position of clarity and you're in a position where you can help them in that buying journey now. And so Mm -hmm. you can decide what resources, what actions you can take to help them move this forward. Exactly. So that so that, that is more comfortable going through this uh, steps more meaningfully, logically, with free of choice rather than any kind of uh, push from the salesperson. And and notice I notice I didn't ask them what do the steps look like, because if you do that, that shows a lack of experience, and mm. they want to feel like they're in the hands of a professional, someone that is experienced that knows. Mm they like to be guided in a in a way with, with guided but not forced not pushed not tricked or coerced mm. guided by a professional right okay. because people Perfect. mistakenly think that their buyers are very experienced at buying that's not actually true mm. they probably especially the bigger your solution is the less experience they're going to have buying that buying that mm. solution and so they probably don't know what they need to do inside their own business so if you noticed, I outlined that by saying, look, when we typically speak to other CTOs, this is how the stages look like. Mm. Can you tell me, does that look the same for you? Is there something in addition that's required? So you see, I haven't forced anything on them. I haven't even asked them, right? I've guided them. So yeah. Exactly, exactly. And it makes more comfortable for them to come up and openly share what could be the next possibilities within the context of their organization. Absolutely. Absolutely. Fine. Fine. So, oh, uh, can you share uh, b- based on this all this experience, irrespective of whatever the industry, um, uh, what what are the any of the examples or, or any of the case study or the testimony or whatever it is you without having this neuroscience experience, you would have not been dealt that way. Because I have that experience and I could able to flexibly understand each step of the buyer's journey, that is why I could nail this down. Uh, whether your clients, uh, maybe you are coaching a client or uh, training those, mentoring that team, hand-holding the team, or your own experience of selling, whatever it is. Because of this neuroscience experience, you did that. Of course, everything that you do is basically about that but something that people can relate immediately. Yeah. So there are four stages in the neuroscience of making a decision. Mm. Um, And if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have appreciated those four things really well. Um, So the first stage is um, the calculating and evaluation um, of external information. So what that means is when I'm, before I make a decision, I'm absorbing external information about the topic that I'm going to make a decision on. Um, And we automatically calculate and evaluate that external information. 
So mm -hmm. is it reliable information? Is it good quality information? How do I apply mm -hmm. that information? Right. Um, and that's really powerful for salespeople because you can start working with and for founders of businesses because now you're starting to look at the content that you send out there and the brand you stand for in a very different way. Mm. Um, I started working with my marketing team in a far better, more collaborative way rather than just getting leads from them. Um, I started working with them on, you know, I'm seeing that our buyers are assessing this type of information. This seems to be very important for them when they're thinking about the next stage of the journey. How do we create content that helps them think about that stage, right? Uh, so that's the first stage. Um, the second one is assessing gains and losses. Now, this is really, really this was very eye-opening because in sales, we are trained to always think about the gains, always think about the benefits, push the benefits to them. The problem with that is we naturally assess the risk of loss. Mm. And most salespeople don't address that risk of loss. They don't think, well, what could, um, what, what is the buyer thinking about the risks here? And what's, how am I mitigating those risks for them? So it's not just the value of the product, but it's also other elements of the in, relationship. Um, and salespeople don't also think about their own business to say, okay, this deal looks really exciting. Let me think of all the ways what, how I can convince that person. Yeah. But what they should be looking at is, um, where are the risks in my deal right now? Where are the risks in my own pipeline right now? And how do I work to mitigate those risks or eliminate them? Mm. Uh, I have this important sale coming up now. You know, most of the time we're trained to think of all the reasons why they should buy, but we're not always asked, tell me about all the reasons why they won't buy. Mm. And what mm. are you doing with that? So assessing gains and losses is very important. The third stage is what's called plan implementation. Think of that as the implementation of your product and service into the buyer's business. Um, and where we tend to lack is explaining how that will apply in their business. What is the vision of service? Mm. Um, a lot of the times um, a buyer hesitates because they don't quite understand how this is going to work in their world. Or mm -hmm. they're worried about they pay all this money for the solution. How many times have you heard this? You pay all this money for a solution, but it doesn't get used. Mm. And so all that money and time is wasted. Or they might be worried about, okay, if I'm going to implement this in my business, uh, do I have the resources to do that? Am I going to have to ask my team to, to, am I going to have to give them extra work to do this? Are they going to want to do this? Mm. Um, so salespeople that think about that plan and implementation and understanding the resources that the buyers have on their side, um, clarifying those resources, figuring out where it's going to be difficult for the buyer and helping them do that, that whole vision of service, um, that was very important to understand. And it was a very big eye opener for me. Um, and then the fourth and final one is the pursuit of the action or goal. Mm. And why I talk about emotions and why I say emotions is the currency by which we evaluate life is because there's a part in your brain that kind of just sits below the prefrontal cortex. It's called the orbitofrontal lobe. Okay. It has a couple of functions. One of those functions is it helps assess um, whether you should pursue an action or a goal. Now, here's the, here's the we all hear that emotions are very important in our decision making. Um, you, you hear people talk about, um, you know, serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin, all those kind of feel good chemicals, those. Uh, in, endorphins, etc. Oh. Um, but here's the here's the thing that it really comes down to. If that orbitofrontal lobe is damaged, mm. we've seen this in patients, you are unable to make any form of decision, whether that's decision to pick up this glass of water because I'm thirsty, mm. decision to go to the toilet, decision to um, hug someone, decision to walk from here to there, um, even the big from, from the... Yeah, from the smallest decision to the big decision, it's called, um, you know, what you what we observe in patients that have that is extreme apathy, mm. right? Um, now, here's what's in, what's incredible and surprising is that this orbitofrontal lobe, how does it make a decision? It's not logic. Mm. All it does is it basically says, what will my emotions be when I achieve that action or goal? 
versus what my emotions are now. Oh. That's it. That is all it does to decide whether it should take action. It is the delta, the difference between my current emotional state and what I believe my emotional state will be when I achieve that action or goal. Mm. That is it. And and it and so that is hopefully going to give your 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 audience the single most powerful reason why emotions are incredibly important in a decision making process. And yet in sales, mm. we especially B two B sales, we rarely think about the emotional state of the buyer. Um, mm. There was a joint study conducted by Google, Motista, and CEB. CEB was a company I was a sales leader in, and we found that the emo what they call personal value not business value but personal value i call it emotional value has twice the level of impact as business value in a b2b sales process in a buying process mm. and so uh, you know buyers that saw um, uh, personal value were 68 percent more likely to buy a solution from someone um, so, uh, buyers that saw personal value 71 percent of those buyers that saw personal value will pay a premium for that particular product versus another vendor where they only see business value, oh. right? So, so personal value and emotion are so integral. It is the currency by which we evaluate life. And okay. if you don't understand that and use that to your advantage, you're missing a picture here that is so big. Yeah. That it's it driving people like a radar. Sorry? It's driving people like a radar. And it, it becomes personal value and emotions becomes the factors of looking at the entire life, including the business transactions, right? Absolutely. So um, one, one simple thing that we found was that 69% of buyers said that the primary reason, in, in my own research, the primary reason why a buyer selected a vendor over others was because they believed that that vendor or that salesperson was either was better able to either protect or elevate their career. Mm. And so that's a personal value. That's an emotional value, not a business value. Mm. So um, think about the emotions. Think about the personal value for the buyer. Think about why this is personally important for them to do. Um, if you do that, this sounds difficult for people and hard, but when you do that, um, you will find that you know things open up in a much bigger way and makes more sense to you. You will start to see a dramatic improvement in your sales success rate. Wonderful. These are the four elements. I absolutely nailed down. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, last question I would like to ask is uh, based on the current situation about the salespeople's life or the founders, co-founders' life. Yeah. Um, from the neuroscience and psychology perspective, because uh, of, of, from the smaller company to bigger companies, million-dollar companies, irrespective of the industry. Do these people, founders and salespeople, irrespective of the level that they are operating within their organization, hmm. from the perspective of the social media and then uh, online AI era, do they have to build the personal branding to prime or influence sales? Because usually it is marketing, uh, it was earlier. Uh, it was a little bit marketing, more of sales process. Now it is more of marketing, less of sales process. It's how it's happening right now. So because that is already proved in many industries, mm. as part of that marketing or as part of that uh, uh, influencing the buyers before they are actually get in touch with us, should these founders or the business owners or the sales and marketing people, should they uh, start the branding on their name on the industry or should they brand give more focus and budgets to their brand brand name or company name or that particular product's name uh, how do you look at from the neuroscience perspective and then based on the current trends happening within the sales yeah it's a really good question um so we already Companies already do that on their brand level. If they're not, they should, for sure. Wow. Um, the problem with the brand level and marketing is it's still all about them rather than the buyer. So, mm. so my advice to anyone involved in marketing is 
go and have a look at the content that you're sending out there. Um, and, you know, is the content, uh, you know, really of value to the buyer? So for example, content that I see about, you know, we've opened up this new office in this area or um, our, we've upgraded our website, you know, buyers just don't care about mm. that, mm. right? So um, talk about the things that buyers care about, right? And and stop, stop talking about your product, et cetera, because, you know, buyers don't care about that until they see that you understand them so focus first on demonstrating that you understand their world right and mm. recognize their their world mm. um so from that brand perspective yes companies are already doing that but but i you know i think that they could change that because from a neuroscience perspective again buyers just don't care about your product they care and about their world from the company or yeah 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 um in terms of sales people and founders should they work on their personal brand absolutely Absolutely. This is very, very, very important. Now, we live in a hyper competitive world where we want to see more personalization as buyers. Um, and the more complex and the more integral that salesperson is to the business, to the buyer, especially if it's a very complex solution, um, the more they need to be comfortable and confident in both the seller and the company because they are placing their career in the hands of those individuals and those businesses. And so salesperson, mistake I see with salespeople is that they build their brand about how excellent they are in sales and they probably provide pod, posts about how to do sales well. A buyer doesn't want to hear that. Um, what they want to see is that this salesperson is a professional and knowledgeable in their area, right? And so if a salesperson is posting more about the buyer's industry and the trends that are happening there, um, you know, thoughts around some of those trends or activities and what's what mm -hmm. CTOs are doing, for example, um, advice around, you know, what CTOs should be seeing based upon their experience and the results that they've seen in their own business from working with all the other CTOs. Um, that is the thing that they should be building their brand around. It's around their professionalism and, and their, uh, it's around their brand as a professional in that field right? Not sales, but in the field of working with CTOs, being an advisor to a CTO, whoever the buyer is. Okay. And so that's very important. Um, the founder should also do something like that. Mm. For the founder, it's a bit different as well. Um, so firstly, they need to show that they as founders know their buyer's industry, experts in their buyer's industry, giving advice about those buyers and what they should be doing, that kind of stuff. Same as a salesperson. But what the founder needs to do is a bit more than that. The founder needs to show that they are, they need to build their brand as a founder that high quality people want to come and work for. Mm. So if you want to attract great salespeople to come and work for your company or great partners to come and work with you, you've got to build your brand as um, an, an incredible employer, yeah. right? And and that's showing the values that these mm -hmm. people really value, et cetera. Um, you know, if you want to be seen, if you want to get investment or if you want a buyout, um, again, you want to show as a founder that you're building a business that's sustainable, a business that if someone buys, um, so that's not to say, hey, you know, we, we are incredible in our financial management and all that kind of stuff. It's no, 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 we, are, we were observing these trends. And, you know, that's why we built this product around that to help buyers do that. And actually, it has a repeatable way, you know, it, it's, it's whatever is required to help you right. become more attractive. And for a founder, it's a 360 situation, right? Um, right. For a founder, it's about the the investing com investor community. It's about the partnership community. It's about the employer community. It's about the client community as well. It's about the yeah. PR as well. Um, and so, yes, in a in a short answer, yes, um, there has to be personal brand building in order for you to stand out, as well as brand building from the marketing. But make it about the buyers or whatever community it is that you're speaking with, not about you, not about your skills as a great founder or a great salesperson. It's about the values and principles that you bring to the table. It's about understanding the buyer's situation and giving them advice and your perspective um, and inviting dialogue. It's not just you saying, this is what you should do and take it or leave it. It's about giving your perspective, but inviting the community to to share their perspective with you, to have a dialogue with you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, it's very important. You should not leave it just with the brand and marketing people to do mm. it because that, it, it, there's no human touch to it. Mm -hmm. The connection is missing. So that has to be engaging con connections should happen. 
Exactly. And again, that doesn't happen without you knowing. About That's why I start with know your bias, do your research, yeah. become obsessed about your. I call, okay. People say, I said before, fall in love with your customer. I actually take it further. I say, become buyer obsessed, become so obsessed about your buyers. Spend time, that, you mentioned very clearly. Yeah, absolutely. So you can't do any of these things that I've talked about until you okay. do that first. Without doing That's that, it, so doesn't, uh, it doesn't easy for us to go through the next process. That's true. So absolutely, uh, absolutely spot on uh, insights. I am really excited. And I was, somewhere I felt like I was uh, sitting in a session for that particular topic uh, and then learning from uh, a training Time. So absolutely the viewers of this video definitely get the high value, especially those who are into the B2B, whether they are the founders, uh, sales managers or sales people, irrespective of the level that they are operating. Uh, the one thing that I request from your side is how to uh, learn from you. Uh, how to uh, is there uh, uh, where to how to approach you uh, for their business for their sales teams trainings if you can share including the urls uh, contact numbers email IDs, that will be really good whatever that you can share so that our people who watch this video should be able to connect with you and learn more aspects because i am pretty much sure from the uh, neuroscience background and the understanding the uh, buying influencing uh, factors, buyers influencing factors in this depth, uh, those uh, insights you should reach to the people who exactly require this. So please share your contact details, how people can, uh, founders or salespeople can approach you. Yeah, th thank you Chandra for, for asking and offering that. Um, so firstly, I'm on LinkedIn every day. Um, I post a ton of content out on there with some very unusual and different advice compared to everyone else. Um, so you can find me on forward slash Murray Damon um, and, you know, for, connect with me. Tell, tell me, tell me how you came across me. Tell me that you've, you've listened to our, our podcast here and, and you wanted to reach out to me and, and through my, um, through my profile, you'll see various resources. There's a newsletter that I post every Friday. It's called the Formidable Friday Newsletter. Um, so you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, you can also come to my website, uh, proverbialdoor.com, or one word, .com. Um, and there are various resources that you can look at. You can, you'll be able to contact me. Um, but there are three things that you can look at there. Number one is the kind of coaching and training. You can learn more about that. Uh, number two is if you're a founder that is about to scale their sales team, so you're now hiring salespeople, you want to create a professional sales function. If you want to do that without losing hundreds of thousands of dollars, making some pretty bad mistakes, which we see mm. a lot, if you want to create a function that will set you up for the next five years and beyond with high performance, you know, we can help you with that. And it's called the scale sales blueprint. So you can look at that. If you're a salesperson or if you're a founder doing sales, um, I've created a diagnostic. It's 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 a one of a kind diagnostic in terms of how detailed it is. Um, it will help you assess uh, your your sophistication level across the twenty seven core skills required to be a great salesperson, and oh, it's all based on neuroscience. Yeah, it's very cheap. It's a hundred. It's ninety seven pounds to do. You will get a sixty page document, and that document will tell you on the 27 core skills, what level you are for each one. Mm. And, and it will give you coaching guidance on how to move from what the level you are to the level above you now. And so it gives you resources. It gives you advice on the things that you need to do. We even prioritize it based upon, you know, where are your strengths from the answers you've given that you want to focus on, make sure you stay strong and grow stronger in. Where are the areas that you are particularly need more development and you might want to look at that as well so we don't just say work on all 27 we prioritize it for you based upon the strengths that this diagnostic has identified from your answers so if, if you want to find out straight away you know where you stand and how you need to get better and you might want to work mm -hmm. with your manager or your Perfect. own coach and that's a blueprint for 97 pounds which is very cheap you can get that and it's a one of a kind right and 
it's based upon the research we've done both in neuroscience as well as all the bio-led research that we've done um so so those are the kind of ways that you get in contact with me and you can also contact me through the website and through linkedin i'm very very engaging with all the community uh, and I, I i freely talk to people to help them out and and see how we can take their success to the next level wow wonderful thank you so much for sharing those details i really appreciate that uh, you have nailed down 27 areas where they can assist themselves really helpful so all those people especially sales people who are watching this particular video please try to use those resources that moed has to give you because it's not just uh, an experienced sharing or it's not just a uh, uh, getting the fundamentals uh, sharing in a different perspective. It is science-based. It's a proven science-based. So I request uh, if you want to improve your sales skills, improve your approach towards the sales and adapt to the uh, real-time practical B2B sales expertise for today's need is to go through the science-based selling rather than uh, personalized expectations throwing some stones and then get some result. So thank you so much, Moit, for your valuable time. I really appreciate your time. Hopefully, I feel like uh, it's one hour is gone just like that. And there is a lot of things that Agreed. we can discuss. So hopefully, I get a chance to have uh, another time with you with more detailed uh, work on different aspects that we have not covered yet. Yeah, thank my pleasure. And thank you. Time. Yeah, thank you, Chandra, for inviting me. Uh, you ask great questions and it's a great experience. You're doing a good thing here. Thank you.